don't think any of us are surprised by the fact that the battle of the sexes, male and female, is a battle that rages on and it has raged on for uh, many, many decades. There are uh, endless jokes, are there not, about men? There are endless jokes about women. I didn't have to search far and wide to find a few. I had to find a few that were appropriate for church. And uh, I want to start with the men first this morning. Uh, what do you call a man with a half a brain? Gifted. <laughs> What's the difference between govern government bonds and men? Bonds mature. <laughs> now to the ladies. <laughs> how do you know? How do you know when a woman is about to say something smart? When she starts her sentence with, a man once told me. <laughs> Why does everybody moan at the ladies once, but nobody moans for the men? Um, how, did, how did the medical community come up with the term PMS? Mad cow disease was already taken. This will be my last week as your pastor. <laughs> um, <laughs> Genesis 127. Genesis 127 says that God created male and female. He created them. Why do we laugh at the differences between a man and a woman? Is because God created a man and a woman with great distinction. And we celebrate and we lift it up and we honor it here uh, this morning. All creation up until the sixth day, and frankly the second half of the sixth day, all of creation up until this point is just a warm-up. It's just a, it's just a warm-up. In fact, I would uh, call the first five days of creation kind of like the movie previews before the feature film. And it's not because man is so great, it's because our God is so awesome. In fact, I would call, uh, I would call everything up until day six here just appetizers to the queen's dinner. And this morning, we're going to uh, jump into two verses that I didn't think were controversial 20 years ago. I didn't think were controversial, frankly, 10 years ago, but have uh, stirred now a great controversy. And my desire is to be uh, gracious and um, a heart of, of Jesus, because I don't know if you know this, Jesus came to die for sinners, which all of us are one of them. And so uh, I, I, want, I want to do that and come across that way, and I pray the Lord will allow that. But at the same token, I want, to, I want to clarify biblically some very key aspects of God's word to us this morning. Um, notice verse 26 and 27. Let me just read our passage uh, and follow along with me. Then God said, God's been talking a lot uh, the first six days of creation, and when he speaks, molecules jump, atoms form, and, and that's just kind of how creation goes. And God said, ex nihilo, out of nothing he creates things. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This, my friends, is the basis. It's the foundation. It's the bedrock of biblical anthropology. Uh, you have to start here when you talk about studying uh, anthropology, the study of man, the study of humanity. Now, uh, this, this passage, this uh, portion of Scripture, 26 and 27, gives man's life meaning. It gives man's life uh, value. It gives man's life purpose. And it is a, a needed and such a needed word uh, today because life is so devalued, is it not, in our culture today? Life has become uh, cheap and, uh, unfortunately, um, discardable. And uh, for the last 200 years, this has been uh, forced upon us. For 200 years, humanism uh, has been trying to chip away, erase um, this truth that God created man. God created man. He created a male and female. He created them. And we now live today, present culture, we live in the backwash of that godless religion called humanism, uh, where life has become a choice. Human worth has become a judgment call, and gender has become fluid. 
Creation of man can only be called one thing, friends, sacred, sacred, sacred. That's what creation of man is. And God is moving up in his progression of creation, and he finds himself coming to his very unique and sacred, sacred creation of man. Um, I want you to see there's two aspects in these uh, two verses. We're going to cover one this week, one next week. Uh, I want you to see on the screen, we're going to talk about in these two verses the sacred identity and the sacred responsibility of man. I use man in the sense of humanity. Uh, the, sacred, uh, the, <laughs> the sacred identity and the sacred responsibility. Uh, today, I want to dig out, I want to dig out the sacred identity, and then next week, I want to drill down on uh, the sacred responsibility of man. And so, if you're ready to jump in, say, jump. Yeah. Write the first point down. I want to give you three points this morning, and then at the very end, I want to give you, I want to give you um, the answer to the question, uh, so what, what do we do now as Christ followers, okay? So, three points, and then answer the question, so what do we, how do we respond, what do we do? The first thing you're going to see in these two passages or two verses is, is the fact that uh, the creation of man was a sacred choice of the Godhead. It was a sacred choice of the Godhead. Notice what it says there. Let us, let us, uh, eighth grade English, personal pronoun, let us make man in our, eighth grade English, our personal pronoun, our image. God has never said in the last five days of creation, check it out for yourself, has never said the phrase, let us. He now comes to the creation of man, and he uses these personal pronouns because he's talking about a very distinct and a very divine uh, creation. This creation that he's now about to do, he's done the universe, he's done the Milky Way, he's done the, he's done the, the ground, dry land, and the seas, and the light, and the stars, and he's done all of that. He's done, done, done with that. Stick a fork in it, it's over, and now he comes to this divine creation, a creation that is going to be very personal, a creation that's going to be very intimate, a creation that's going to be very relational. Up until now, uh, that creation, those are words you probably wouldn't use to describe anything that God had created up until this point. Now you'll see that all of creation up until this point has come about by divine decree. God says, let there be, and there was. But now we come, we come here in verse 26 and 27, not just to a divine decree, we come to a divine design. There is something, there is something about this design, this part of creation, that has divinity to it. God even says at the end of day six, which is the only time that he says this of the six days of creation, is day six. He calls what he did on day six, he doesn't call it just good, he calls it very good. Uh, he, he, his own words uh, make the, the day six a significant day in creation. And notice he says, let us, let us, the plurality of the Godhead. Our, our, our Jewish friends will say, no, that he's speaking of the angels. He's speaking of the angels. Um, I, I, the, reason, the reason that I don't believe that is, is a couple reasons. Number one, um, it, it, it is a plural noun. Let us make man in our image, personal pronoun, uh, but it's a singular verb, the, to make, to create, singular, meaning this, that it was one person doing the creation, okay? So now we have this uniplural noun we got to figure out, but it's one, it's one entity, one being that is actually doing the creation, is making, creating, and forming, fashioning. So here again, what we have is an introduction to the Trinity, and understand this, the most, sacred, the most sacred, sanctified, sovereign assembly is the Godhead itself. As the Godhead convenes on things, what you have is the most sanctified, sacred, sovereign assembly ever known in the universe or outside. What happens is Jesus, the Father, and the Son come together to make man. The reason we know it's, it's Jesus, the Spirit of God, and the Father is simply this. It's a plural, it's a plural, a uniplural noun. They're making something. We know Jesus was there. Remember John 17, 5, high priestly prayer? And he says, Father, I want to come back to heaven and enjoy the glory that I enjoyed with you before the foundation of the world. Jesus was there. Turn with me to John chapter 1 really quick. Turn with me to John chapter 1. Can you turn to John 1? 
Can you make the sound at least? John 1, John 1, John chapter 1. And just look at verse 1. Let's not go deep into John. Let's just look at John, how he starts his gospel. Notice this, verse 1 of chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? Well, later on we find out it's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. Beginning of what, John? The beginning of the beginning. He was there. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. So he had to be there. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. You see that Jesus is very present in that moment. Colossians chapter 1, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. He was there at creation. You say, Pastor, well, okay, I got the Father. I got God there. I can kind of see what you're saying with the Son. But where, where's, where's the Spirit of God? Well, just remember, go back to verse 2 of chapter 1 of Genesis. The Spirit of God was hovering, moving over, uh, mother henning, if you will, the surfaces of the water. So Moses already reveals to us that the Father's there, the Spirit's there. Jesus, when he shows up in the Gospels, reminds us he was there, and Paul told us that all things were created by him. And so you have this sacred, um, sanctified, sovereign assembly that took place on the sixth day of creation, and together, you hear this? Together they made a choice to create man. They didn't choose to create man because there was a deficiency in God. There's no deficit in God. God, God, God is not saying inside the Trinity, inside that assembly of three persons there, one God. He's not saying, you know what, I, just, I feel empty on the inside. I feel like we need something more. No, he could have stopped at day two of creation. All the heavens declare the glory of God, so he could have just went with that. But he made a sacred choice to create humanity. This is a needed word today. We are, we are an over-medicated, overly depressed culture because we're trying to find our self-worth in Self Magazine, and it doesn't come from that. It comes from the sacred fact that God chose. He made a sovereign choice to create you and to create me. We bear the very image, as you'll see in a moment, of God himself. That's where self, I don't want self-worth, I want God-worth. And the God-worth comes from the fact that God placed his choice on humanity and says, I choose to create you, not because I'm in a deficit, but because I want to. Number two, write this down, not only sacred choice, but I want you to see the sacred image of the sacred identity. The sacred image. Notice the phrase there in the verse, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Uh, make, uh, make man in our image is actually stated three times in this passage. Parents, when you tell your kids something once, you want them to listen. When you tell them twice, you really want them to listen. If you got to tell them three times, someone's getting the paddle. Well, you know what? Moses, by the inspiration of God here, is wanting us to understand something, that we were made in the image of God. He tells it three times. He, he, he's reminding us that you are distinctly different than the rest of creation. You're not just some creatures. You're not just some, uh, some bugs. You're not just some mammals. You're, you're, you know, you, no, 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 no. You, you have a sacred, you have a sacred image. Did you hear that? You have a sacred image. You're not just a creature. There are a lot of creatures out there, but you're not just a creature. You are a sacred creation, an image bearer of God himself, the Imago Dei, in the image of God. And what's interesting here is, 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 is the fact that man, right here in verse 26 and 27, is given authority over the creation and over the creatures. So he, he says, I'm going to put you in charge of some things. You're not part of them. You're, you're the boss. You're in charge of them. We'll talk about that next week. And notice what he says. He says it two different ways. In our image and after our likeness. Now, now some people say that those are two distinct statements and it refers to different aspects of man. Um, you know, you can make your own decision. You've got to work out your own salvation on that. I, I see that as, uh, as parallel repetitive statements that, that the Hebrews did often. They would say, Lord, Lord, Lord. 
They would say, holy, holy, holy. They had the repetition to drive home a point that, that you, you bear the image, you bear the likeness of God himself. <laughs> Think about it. As Dr. Henry Morris, a, a staunch creationist, um, he says, just, just look at man's posture. Man's posture is different than all of creatures. Other creatures are, two le- are either two legs or four legs, or they're on their bellies looking at the ground. He says, man is created upright that can look up and see the heavens that declare the glory of God, can open up their arms and express worship and adoration to a sovereign, holy, sacred God. You see, the, pas- the posture alone speaks of God's incredible design and creation of man. None of the other creatures have this. I love our dog, Riley. I mean, she's, she really is a, she's a sweet dog. She really is. But I don't see God in her. I see demons sometimes, but I don't see God in her. But I do. I do see God in my wife. And I do see God in my kids. And I see God in you people. You bear the image, you bear the image of your creator. You're distinctly different. You see, we're not just mere bugs and rats and mammals and fishes and flies and birds. God chose to make us and God made us in his image. We're unlike the animal kingdom. Sure, animals have consciousness, but they don't have self-consciousness. They don't have a emotional intelligence. They, they, they're not morally aware. They, they don't have true intimate relationships. Relationships that involve intellect, will, emotion, language, and rationality. Young adult mammals don't say, hey, let's get together and hang out tonight. The seagull, have you ever had your... Have you ever had your food stolen by, show of hands, confession time, (laughs) stolen on the beach? Have you ever seen a seagull like two hours later come back and go, I am so sorry. (laughs) I I just want to apologize and make things right. No, they're often gone. What's fascinating to me is how the uh, staunch atheist evolutionists still can see the distinction of humanity but can't make the correlation to God. Uh, His name is Dr. Thomas Suddendorf. He's an evolutionary psychologist, and he wrote a book entitled The Gap. Here's what he says about humanity. Now, this is an atheist. This is an evolutionist. He sees the chain of progression of evolution, but notice what he says about humanity. He says, it is our mental capacities that have allowed us to tame fire and invent the wheel." They enable us to construct tools that make us stronger, fiercer, faster, and more precise, resilient, and versatile than any other beast. We build machines that speed us from one place to another, even to outer space. We investigate nature and rapidly accumulate and share knowledge. We reflect on and argue about our present situation, our history, and our destiny. We envision wonderful, harmonious worlds as easily as we do dreadful tyrannies. Our minds have spawned civilizations and technologies that have changed the face of the earth. But he can't connect the dot to an all-sovereign, all-creating God. You see, you can't say that about any other single part of creation. You can't write that paragraph about anything else inside of creation except that of man. You see, the image of God that that he placed on us, it gives us personhood. It's what gives us relationship. That's why you'll see here shortly, it's not good for man to be alone. Why? He was created in the image of God. What did God have? The God had the assembly, had a relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we were given this ability to relate to others. What's interesting, circle that word image. In the Hebrew, it's salam, salem, sorry, salem. It speaks of a carving. Uh, Salem is this, speaks of a graven image. It's used multiple times throughout the uh, Old Testament. 
Uh, in other words, what, what, what Moses is writing here, man was carved into the image of God. God was the pattern for humanity. This is not true of anything else in creation. This is not true of anything else in, in the space-time universe of ours. Oh, only God can carve his image, right? In fact, if man carves an image of God, it's what? It's sin. It's sinful. It's sinful to carve a graven image of God, but God can carve his own image, and he did that in humanity. He did that in each of us. So how in the world, is what you're thinking, I hope, how in the world do we, we bear the very image of God? Does he look like Pastor Todd? I hope not. No, 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 no. We, we bear the image of God in a much deeper, broader way. In fact, it's impossible when you think about it, to bear the image of God. Grandpa John told us God is, just three words, God is spirit. Okay, God is spirit. So how do you, how do you resemble that? Well, <laughs> let me try to explain it this way. My son, my, my son Luke, uh, he bears the physical image of his pops. What a blessing. What a, what a just a stubble blessing of the Lord. I've, I tell him they're, they're going to get good at plastic surgery, and his hope is at the end of a knife. And uh, um, he bears my image. Now, all three of my kids bear my image in a different way. You've heard the phrase, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. My kids bear something even greater than physical likeness. All three of my kids bear the image of my attributes of actions and attitudes and thinking and choosing. Many of them choose the same thing. Many of them choose the opposite. <laughs> but it's all correlated into mom and dad. So how do we bear the image of God? We bear the attributes. We share the attributes with God. The theologians have two big words for it. Uh, the first word is what is referred to the first word is communicable attributes. Communicable. Did you catch that? Communicable. I know a lot of big words. Watermelon, Mississippi, communicable. Communicable attributes are attributes that we share with God. Incommunicable attributes are the attributes we don't share with God. What's the difference? Well, let's talk about the ones we do share. We, we share the idea that we can, uh, we can retain and have wisdom. We can understand truth. We exhibit love and mercy, compassion and patience, moral consciousness. We can have anger and wrath. We can, we can discern good and evil. We're, we have the ability to reason. We have the ability to relate. The things we don't share with God are things like uh, omniscience. We're not all-knowing. We're not all-knowing. Uh, we're all, omnipotent. We're not all powerful. We don't share his perfection yet. Uh, sovereignty. We don't share in his sovereignty. I don't have sovereignty over the universe. I, I don't even have sovereignty in my house sometimes. And, and so I don't share his rule and reign that he has. I'm not transcendent. I, 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 am, I am not self-sufficient. I depend on everything to exist. God depends on nothing to exist. Uh, I, I'm not omnipresent. I'm not at all places at the same time, though my mom did exhibit this at times. <laughs> um, what's so amazing, and here, here's, the, here's the theological part. I want you to hear this. I really want you to hear this. What's so amazing to me as I was digging this out is that as God was creating Adam, man, remember what man in Hebrew is, Adam, Adam. So he's the first Adam. So God not only created atoms, but he created Adam, Adam, humanity. And the moment God is creating Adam, he knows that someday his son is going to put on that frame. Does that thought just blow your mind? As he's forming and fashioning him, he's thinking someday my son's going to wear this. He's going to walk around like this. You see, we, we're, we're made in the likeness of God, Genesis 126. But Jesus Christ was made in the likeness of man, Philippians 2.7. And so as God creates this Adam, in the back of his mind, he knows. Jesus knows. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He knows he's going to put that very suit on. So we have sacred, number one. Sacred what? Sacred what? 
Only eight people, remember? Sacred choice. God chose to make man. We, number two, we have sacred what? Image. And number three, with number three, we come to sacred gender. Sacred gender. Uh, yeah. I think, I, I don't know if I said it at this service or not, but uh, 10 years ago, I would have never thought that I actually had to preach on he created them male and female. I didn't think that was going to be debatable, but it is these days. He, he created gender. Uh, notice the phrase, he created him, the Adam, humanity, mankind, and then he says, I broke it into two categories, male and female, he created them. God is the designer of gender. Gender is not a multiple choice question. God created two genders, male and female. It seems so simply clear, does it not? But I uh, did a little re research this week, documented, it is now documented, the latest count of gender has increased to 81 different genders. 81 different genders. Reflected now, many of them, on college applications, DMV, and the like. A whole new vo vocabulary has been created because of these different genders. Words that I didn't even know exist. Some words I can't even say in church. But all, all kinds of words. A whole dictionary now of a new vocabulary. Transgender, cisgendered, gender nonconforming, gender non-binary, intersex, transsexual, gender identity, multigender, agender, gender fluidity, gender dysphoria, misgendering, demigendering, gender neutral, bisexual, gender attribution, gender gifted, gender list, gender spectrum, gender identity disorder. Do I have to keep going? Because I got hundreds of them. Literally hundreds of them. And love us, let me just say to you this morning, I, I, I don't want to cap on anybody. I, I, man, I want, to be, I, want to be, I want to be the most loving, gracious. I want to be like Jesus who spent time with these people. But understand that these banquet of terms and these make-believe identities have led to a thousand evils. <laughs> it's led to a thousand evils. We, we, therefore, now we, we, let, we let boys in girls' locker rooms. We, we, we allow men and women to mutilate their bodies. We, we have a depressed, suicidal culture, and the list goes on and on because of these 81 new genders. See, gender wasn't the creation of man. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, and then he says he created him, both male and female. We celebrate, we honor the distinction, we esteem and we value the gift of gender by our maker. Don't you love the fact that women are different than men? Guys, yes. <laughs> Ladies, aren't you glad that men are different than women? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Verdict's still out on that one. Loved ones, we, 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 we have to understand gender is God's idea. Gender is God's design. Gender is God's fixed choice. You can say and slap a label on any soup can you want, but what's inside it is what it is. And understand this, that every chromosome in your body, every single chromosome in your body screams out male or female. It's fixed. God designed man to have an XY chromosome and a woman to have an XX chromosome. They are equal, but they are distinctly different. Gender is fixed, and man was created with binary genders. Gender, hear me out on this, gender is assigned at conception and cannot be reassigned. Though our culture today has bifurcated uh, gender um, human gender into two distinct categories. They now say there's a biological gender, what you're born with, biological gender, and then they say there's gender identity. Uh, loved ones, let me just tell you, they're not different. They are the same thing. You can only be one gender. It's designed at, at conception. You are either male or female. There's no such thing as a transgender. It doesn't exist. In fact, trans, transgenderism in my opinion, is living identity suicide. You are literally killing your identity by trying to alter, suppress, mask, or change your gender. You say, how did we get here? 
I'll tell you exactly how we get here. I picked up this. This is a recent uh, quote from Dr. Uh, Deanna Adkins, a professor at Duke University School of Medicine, not your kind of lightweight school by any means. Listen to what she says here. It is, it is scary. She says this, from a medical perspective, the appropriate determinant of sex is gender identity. Gender identity is not only the preferred basis for determining sex, but the only medically supported determinant of sex. Every other method is bad science. You did, you, she just blew a massive cannon hole in my 10th grade biology class. That the civilizations have, have accepted from the beginning of time. Gender, gender is a biological issue. Why, why, why is it a biological issue? Because God created male and female, two genders. Let me, let me quickly try to put this into some medical perspective. You smart people will stay with me. The other ones we'll see at the end of the service. I want to, I want to, try, to try to just, again, I want, I want to try to give you current medical information on this. We know theologically that God created gender. We just were told that in Scripture. He created male and female. But let's, let's, look, at, let's look at some medical information to understand this. February 18, 2019, this year, American Heart Association, a very reputable association, published this. This is about a, a statement about people that are trying to change their gender. A man become a woman, a woman become a man, or any thereof. Here's what they said. People receiving hormone therapy during gender transition have an elevated risk for cardiovascular events such as strokes, blood clots, and heart attacks. Increased odds of breast cancer, insulin resistance, and lipid derangements producing too many red blood cells. Elevated liver function tests, high pl uh, blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes. To be a transgender and to have it medically induced, you are pumping your body full of massive hormone treatments that wreak havoc on every cell in your body. Every cell in your body. John Hopkins University was the first medical center in the United States in the 60s to do a sex reassignment surgery. They started a study in, in the 1970s to, to compare the outcomes of transgender people who had the surgery with the outcomes of transgender people who didn't have the surgery. Here's what they found. They found that sex reassignment surgery patients, subsequent psychosocial adjustments were no better than those who didn't have the surgery. No change. Therefore, here's what John Hopkins Medical Center did. Therefore, Hopkins stopped doing sex reassignment surgery. The first medical center in the U.S. to actually do them stops doing them. Why did they stop? For the single reason that a troubled patient seemed an, an inadequate reason for surgically amputating normal organs. Dr. Paul McHugh, a distinguished professor of psychiatry at John Hopkins University, here's what he said. Transgender men do not become women, nor do transgender women become men. All, including Bruce Jenner, become feminized men or masculinized women, counterfeits or impersonators of the sex with which they identify. In that lies their problematic future. Gender is fixed. You can't reassign it. The tragedy is it's happening all over the the world, if not proliferating in the U.S. And my, my heart breaks for these people. They're lost. They're looking, they're looking for hope. They're looking for, they're looking for fulfillment and joy and peace. And they're looking in all the wrong places. Just recently in the New York Times, an article was written by Andrea Long Chu, she is now a trans woman. And she writes this heartfelt, 
heartbreaking op-ed article and acknowledges that just before her surgery, here's what she says. And she took a lot of flack for saying this. She said this. She said, you know, my surgery won't actually reassign my sex. The real fact is my body will regard the surgical changes as wounds. As wounds. Physiologically, ask any doctor, that's what your body sees it as. A wound. You see, the tragedy is that the evidence is out there. And we're watching men and women be pumped full of chemicals and body parts cut off that were meant not to be cut off or changed. And we're watching their lives be shortened. We're watching depression rise like a sky, skyrocket. And the suicide rate is out of control. In 2017, the Obama Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services found this. They found that transgender medical treatment, this is not a church, this is Medicare and Medicaid, found that transgender medical treatment created 19 times greater likelihood for death by suicide and a host of other poor outcomes, such as increased mortality and a psychiatric hospitalization. They increased in malignant neoplasms, cardiovascular disease, both increased two and a half times. Psychiatric hospitalization was almost three times greater than the population. The world-renowned construct, reconstructive surgery, surgeon, Mersilov de Jorvajipvik, that's a cool name, world-renowned reconstructive surgeon, here's what he said. Our clinics are experiencing an increase in reversal surgeries for those who want their previous physical features back. These people express crippling levels of depression and in some instances, rapid suicidal thoughts. Transgenderism is an issue because God created a male and female. We're, we're, we're seeing before our eyes, you've seen it uh, as, as well I have, as we have this now, this intersectionality colliding with all aspects of our culture. I mean, education, municipal services, military employment, and even sports. You know, biological men playing on the women's team, biological women playing on the men's team. Take, take in case, listen to this, take in, uh, for, in case... Um, the 2014 women's mixed martial arts bout between Tamika Brents and Fallon Fox. Listen to this. During a two-minute beating, Tamika Brents suffered a concussion, an orbital bone fracture, and a head wound requiring seven staples. Listen to her words. She said this, I fought a lot of women and have never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. As it turns out, her opponent, Fox, wasn't born female. She is a biological male who identifies as transgender. Fox, Fox goes on, or Brent goes on to explain this. I can't answer whether it's because she was born a man or not because I'm not a doctor. It's a very politically correct statement. I can only say this. I have never felt so overpowered ever in my life, and I am an abnormally strong female in my own right. The last effect, and this is the tragic effect because it's our kids. This whole idea of hormone suppression, suppressing pre puberty so that they can have the surgery when they want, in my opinion, next to abortion, Parents allowing kids to medically or even surgically mask their God-given gender demonstrates the most heinous form of child abuse, in my opinion. The long-term effects of hormone suppression are horrendous. They're horrendous. There's a drug called Lupron. It's almost, it's almost a billion-dollar industry in America. Its therapy was to be used for prostate cancer in men, and it was also... Uh, uh, it was also supposed to be used for endometriosis in women. They're now giving it to kids. 
what they're, what they're finding out, according to a September article, this September article by Dr. Michael Laidlaw, a Rockland, California-based endocrinologist, not a Christian. He says this, reports have emerged in recent years showing that the pediatric version of the drug comes with few warnings about long-term side effects and leads to lasting and severe health problems. Food and Drug Administration you know, has recorded thousands of deaths associated with this drug. Between 2004 and June of this year, FDA documented over 33,000 adverse reactions. 19,000 of them were serious. And of the 19, 6,000 of them were deaths. Yet we continue to inject our kids with this hormone. Our heart breaks for this. An easy response is to get angry. But that doesn't help. Our prayer should be, Lord, crush our hearts with this. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gotten angry at somebody for getting lost while they were driving somewhere? <laughs> Ladies? Let's, let's, let's have a little bit of cathartic counseling here for a moment. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten angry at somebody for getting lost. We'll, we'll touch on lying next week. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean by that? I mean dr lost when someone's driving. Either you were waiting for them and you're constantly looking at your watch going, where are they, where are they? Or you're in the car with them and you're yelling at them, why didn't you listen to directions? When you think about it, getting angry at a lost person, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't make them unlost in the car. In fact, I would argue it might make them more lost. Loved ones, we live in a lost culture. Getting angry at the lost is of no value. In fact, many times it makes them more lost. Anger is not the solution. Why do people make sinful choices? Because they're lost. As Christ followers, we have the Spirit of God in us, and we still make sinful choices. Imagine being empty on the inside. God, give us compassion. Break our hearts. Remind us that your son came to save lost people. Not found people, lost people. So how do we respond? Be patient. You work with these people. These people are in your families. Be patient. Where you can, give, give the instruction manual, give the directions. But always love. Always love. Our Savior died for lost people. Amen? Amen. Father, we, we can become discouraged. The discouragement can turn into despair and then creep into anger. That's not good for us and it's good for nobody. <laughs> it's definitely not good for the lost person. So, Father, give us the ability to be Jesus. Father, remind us that the bucket of truth that we carry around has two handles on it, and both of those handles are wrapped in grace. So help us to carry the bucket well. And Father, use each of us in your holy, sovereign way to help these people be found by the shepherd. So Father, we pray, we pray, we pray for our own hearts and those that we interact with. 
do a mighty work in both. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.